to protect the innocent. It's alive. They told you he was dead. Brain scan, the ultimate experience in interactive terror. Brain scan is not board squeamish. You gotta look at the ad at least, man. It's in Fangoria. You know, the one with the, uh, with the popping eyeballs on the cover. <laughs> it's interactive, dude. You're in the game, man. It's the most frightening experience you'll ever have the displeasure of coming into contact with. Senseless violence is not entertainment. Please allow me to introduce myself. My name is Trickster. Just doesn't make any sense. I'm back. Please give me the foot. Look! I don't have the second disc. You were described as uh, frightening and strange and weird. Freak came up a couple of times. Buddies forever? You started this and now you're afraid to finish it just like you're afraid of everything else. Of Kimberly, of Fromberg, of telling your father how sick you are being left alone all the time, of your mother who abandoned you. I'm trying to help you. Game over. You lose. Hello, this is Caitlin O'Haney, the final girl from He Knows You're Alone. And you're listening to Hysteria Continues. And indeed you are. Welcome to the future. Uh, by the way of 1994, we are covering kind of sci-fi horror slasher mashup, Brain Scan. Uh, this is episode 305 and we are the Hysteria Continues and we are delighted to be joined by our longtime friend of the show, Michael Ferrari, a.k.a. Meep. Meep, how are you doing? It's been, say, like, before we came on air, and, and full disclosure, uh, because we're covering Brain Scan, which is all about some um, kind of tech stuff, we've had a tech nightmare trying to get it all, to get the, get us all on the line in one go. But we're here, hopefully, unless Trickster comes along and, um, and ruins it all for us. But Meep, how are you doing? I'm good. Thank you. Everything is good here. Excellent. Well, I'm glad to hear it. And you're you are are you an Uber fan of Brain Scan? I, I am a fan. You know, it's uh, it's a movie that. Well, I want first. I wanted to say Happy Anniversary, Brain Scan. It's the 30th anniversary oh. this year. Ah. I think it's April 22nd. So in a couple of weeks, our, our time right now, we will be celebrating and rejoicing in all that is uh, Brain Scan. And um, I'm glad we could do this this uh, this celebrate this little uh, anniversary for it. Excellent. Well, it remains to be seen if we will all be celebrating or not. But uh, always a pleasure to have you on the show. It's been t- far too long. So, you know, welcome aboard. The the good ship hysteria continues and let's hope we stay afloat for the, the rest of the show. Um, Eric, how are you doing? I want to take communion, but not in my mouth, but down here in my pussy. She's not well, Father Conrad. Magdalena, please. That's how I'm doing. Oh, Eric. That, that, so I wasn't going to mention about the, the image I just posted to the Hysteria Continues <gasps> Facebook group of the face swap between Toya and Trickster. Hmm. But look what you made me do. I wasn't going to, I was going to hold, I, was, I wasn't going to mention it, but now I've done that. Yeah, we've well, already uh, posted it. Well, yeah, I know. Yeah, so I'll have my revenge. You'll see. It's an uncanny resemblance, I'm sure no, you it's agree. Not. Uh, well, I think it's just that red hair, wasn't it? The the the, the red hair, the um, the makeup, everything. Trickster the theatricality. wishes he was Toya. Well, you know the the Amdram kind of performance, all those <gasps> kind of things. It just screams Toya to me. But we'll talk about that more a little bit later. But Nathan, I'm more interested in hearing what how Nathan is doing. How how rude! How is Nathan more <laughs> interesting than me? Well, not you, but um, the Toya Trickster oh, okay. comparison. Um, okay, um, I'm I'm all right. Well, we, we we had trouble getting hold of you, didn't we? But we managed to. Yeah, it was difficult. I think Skype wasn't letting me. It gave me an option to start a call, but I thought all that would do was just ring for y'all. We didn't. The screen didn't start pulsating, and you had visions of uh, holding a big chopper. Yeah, it was it was insane. Well, it could happen at any moment. So, uh, if you see any flashing lights, turn off your screen immediately. And uh, Joseph, do you are you looking forward to? Do you have a sp- soft spot for brain scan? Well, that remains to be seen. Of course, playing your cards very close to your chest. I like it. So, well, in time on a tradition, well, let's have a little chat about what we've been watching recently. So, Meep, is there anything you've seen you want to tell us about? Yeah, I could definitely talk about a few things. Uh, just yesterday for family movie night, we did uh, Morgan Stewart's Coming Home. 
which is a teen comedy with John Cryer. Now, I know this is a horror podcast, and uh, why am I mentioning uh, Morgan Stewart's Coming Home? It's because it's a teen movie about a guy who's obsessed with horror movies. So uh, John Cryer's character has a bunch of like really cool horror paraphernalia in his room and horror posters. Um, he shares some, he shares definitely some traits with uh, Edward uh, Furlong in the movie we're going to discuss later, uh, being a horror fan and and uh, being obsessed with that sort of thing. So it's kind of fun, and there's a nice little uh, uh, meet cute he has with a girl at the mall um, at a George Romero signing for uh, one of his, for his book uh, in the 80s. I think it was shot in the mid 80s, 1985. It's a really cute movie. Uh, the kids really enjoyed it. Um, they're at the age now where they can start watching more of these teen comedies and even teen horror movies. Um, and I eventually will show them uh, Brain Scan. But uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun uh, watching that one. And uh, it's always fun seeing um, seeing yourself a bit on the screen, like seeing someone who's uh, obsessed with, like, say, horror movies uh, or, or cult movies, genre movies uh, on the screen because it's so rare that you see that representation at least these days um so that's nice uh nice to have that um and <laughs> during our trip in dc we uh, uh that's another reason why we watch morgan Stewart because it's in dc but uh we watched at the hotel we watched orphan the uh, mm. <laughs> 2000 i think nine horror movie about the little girl uh who uh, terrorizes a family uh with the twist of course and uh, my daughter was especially interested in watching it and, w- and wanting to know why she, she spent the whole time why is she doing this why i'm like trust me you'll know it by the end when it's outlandish twist and uh, she really enjoyed that um she's also a big fan of a movie that's celebrating its 40th anniversary this year we, we also watched this in a, in a hotel oh, room it's not nocturne by Susie and the banshees is it <laughs> <laughs> well uh, uncle eric you'll have to show her that uh have her listen well, to no, that it's it's a it's a film as well it's a concert film yeah go there you go uh so 40th anniversary of terminator oh i know a movie yeah. you guys discussed on this podcast and you know, it's actually her favorite movie of all time, I think. She's obsessed with The Terminator. She's obsessed with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, I don't know where she gets that from. Possibly me. Um, but, yeah, we every time that's on, we'll watch it. We're hoping that it's going to be screening in theaters this year for the 40th anniversary, because she definitely she has been asking, uh, is that going to be playing in theaters? Because she really wants to see it. Um, so that was a lot of fun. Uh, another family movie night. Uh, just before we left, I put on Critters 2, um, the main course, because it's, an, it's one of the rare Easter movies. Um, and it's we watched Critters last year, and they really enjoyed that one, and uh, it was fun just to follow up. I actually saved part two for this year, knowing that it would be a good time to play at Easter time. And they had a lot of fun with that, and it holds up pretty well. Um, in theaters, I did see a f- just a, just a couple of movies. Um, Immaculate, the new, uh, you could say, Catholic horror movie. There's a couple of them playing now. Uh, Ca- uh, Immaculate and uh, The First Omen, and... I was actually kind of surprised by Immaculate. I was really entertained by it. It's it's definitely a slow burn, but uh, once it gets going in that last half, it kind of doesn't stop until the end of the movie, which is really exciting and fun. Uh, Sydney Sweeney was a pretty good lead, uh, had good vibes, had a good atmosphere. Uh, so a nice, neat 90-minute uh, horror movie. Uh, that has it's not quite exactly what you think it's going to be going in which is nice has a nice little twist to it and it shares some um let's say dna with a certain john carpenter movie from the 80s but i won't say which one which will give it away uh but i had a lot of fun with it uh, surprisingly i had you know low expectations given that a lot of these um none <laughs> kind of movies in the last uh, decade have been pretty lame but this one actually it was uh, pretty entertaining and fun um, and then we did go see as a family the new Ghostbusters movie I guess which is horror related and it uh, was not a good movie and <laughs> um, I I don't know I just felt it was a big letdown from some of the other Ghostbusters movies particularly the first two where the emphasis is on comedy and just having fun set pieces. This was kind of loud, 
uh, not much comedy at all, which was weird. And then it borrowed a plot right out of the movie Casper from 1995 with Christina Ricci, kind of stole that plot from that, which is really bizarre. Um, so it was kind of like a, yeah, kind of a meh kind of movie. Um, a genre movie that did come out I wanted to give a little bit of love to is Love Lies Bleeding, which is a new, a kind of a noirish, very pulpish movie uh, with Kristen Stewart. Uh, it has some really dark themes to it, which I think is fitting for this podcast. And um, it was really well done, and Kristen Stewart was phenomenal in it. So I just wanted to give it a little bit of love in this podcast. I love the ending to that movie, by the way. It's so bizarre. It goes to a, another level, which you're not expecting, but it, but actually completely works, strangely. like I love the movie. Yeah, yeah, I saw it, too. I loved it. I thought it was fantastic. I love, you know, Kristen Stewart got a lot of flack a while back there for all the Twilight stuff, and I think she may or may not have had some personal issues, but I love her. I think she's fantastic. I think she's she's embracing who she is, and she really understands um, how to just really command the screen. And she's like, there's a scene early in this movie where she first sees her the object of her desire in this movie. Um, and it's just like, it's, it's just so, just the expressions on her face and the way she just like kind of uh, takes it all in, just a, kind of a really well- well done performance and you know she's always been a good actress but i feel like she's really you know she really is gets to be who she wants to be now on a screen and 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 within a like a genre movie because it is pretty much a like a it could you say it's like even like a 90s neo-noir it has those vibes it's set in 1989 uh but it feels much more like period detail is really good too yeah they get they get a lot of it right but it's not doesn't hit hit you over the head has a really good villain um, who's believable with Ed Harris and yeah, it's just good, really good pulpy uh, neo noir, which uh, I kind of miss. Um, and this was a really well done one. And then lastly, uh, Aliens, the uh, the new 4K came out of the uh, James Cameron um, film. I watched that with my son, and uh, you know, I had very fond memories of going to see that in the theater as a double feature with The Fly in 1986 with my family uh, as a like a 10 o'clock p.m. showing, a double feature showing. And that was like kind of a highlight of me being 11. My son's, you know, he's going on 12. So I thought it was a good time to introduce him to Aliens and The Fly this year. And he loved both and Aliens. This is really well, of course, well done. And uh, a lot's been said about it. It has a lot of horror. Um, uh it's it's definitely a horror movie as well as being a, a really good sci-fi and war movie. So it has a lot going on in it, and uh, you know, lots been said about aliens. But uh, yeah, good good times. Uh, some some pretty good movies lately, which is great. Excellent. I've heard a lot of good things about Immaculate. So uh, and uh, yeah, also the is it Love Lies Bleeding? Um, yeah, you should see that movie, Justin. It really is great. Yeah. Well, when I get home, I'm at uh, my family's at the moment, so in the UK. So when I get home, I'm, I've got long lost of films I need to catch up on. So excellent. Um, well, thank you, Meep. Um, so, uh, well, lots of good stuff there. So, um, Joseph, you've seen a couple of those as well, haven't you? By the sound of it. Yeah. I saw the love lies bleeding, which I really, really enjoyed. Um, I actually saw last night, a uh, dark harvest from last year. I think it was, which, uh, did any of you guys see this or mention it previously on an episode? I don't remember. Is it? I, I have seen it. Um, I've seen, heard some good things about it, and I heard it was kind of, it was, is it kind of slasher adjacent or not? Is it more of a monster no, movie? It's more of a monster movie, mm. and I'll get into that. But um, this one's about a small town in the late 1950s or early 1960s, I think it was, where this supernatural scarecrow named Sawtooth Jack uh, basically manifests on Halloween every year. And the town's teenagers are kind of, I guess for vague mumbo-jumbo reasons, they're tasked yearly with stopping it dead in its tracks before it reaches the town church. And they've kind of made like a battle royale-style game of it called The Run. And basically the winner and his or her family is essentially gifted new cars, new houses, money. And for the teenager who stops Sawtooth dead in his tracks, you know, he gets a new car and a pass to leave town for good. Um, so there's something nefarious going on keeping people in the town. But um, this one wasn't bad. You know, it had excellent cinematography, you know, lots of good gooey gore effects, great monster design. The period detail was immaculate. And, um, you know, like I said, 
that creature design of Sawtooth Jack is, uh, you know, straight out of kind of Lovecraft almost. But I think the problem, like a lot of the newer movies, is I just didn't really care enough about the characters to be invested in what they go through. It also hits a few kind of expected notes without, I guess, without much um, obfuscation plot-wise. And so the finale kind of feels humdrum if you take that into account. But I will recommend it as a curiosity. I mean, it's got a really unique story, which I think may have been based on a novel or some such. And like I said, the period detail really calls to mind something like... uh, Maybe like The Outsiders meets Pumpkinhead. I mean, that's what this movie is, essentially. So it's a good one-time watch, but I wasn't bowled over by it or anything. Okay. I've not anyone else seen that. No. No, I see it sort of pop up, but uh, excellent. Well, anything else, Joseph? Yeah, just one more. And since Meep mentioned a teen comedy, I will mention a new action movie. And that's the Roadhouse remake, which I only mention because I adore the OG Ugh. film. And we always... What? No, no. I've nothing wrong with Roadhouse. It's just the Roadhouse remake has possibly the most despicable person in the universe in it. Are you talking about Conor McGregor? Yep. Yeah, I don't I don't particularly care for him. But we always talk about kind of quote-unquote bad movies. And since I love uh, the OG film so much, I, I kind of caved and watched this one. And this one's okay. I mean, it's definitely not as campy as the original. And it's sort of modernized for that UFC crowd. But I thought Jake Gyllenhaal standing in for Patrick Swayze was pretty good. And there's some real laugh out loud moments that really worked well. And um, the film takes a kind of dark turn with Gyllenhaal's character of of his iteration of the Dalton character that I didn't really expect. So it's a decent one time watch, but I'll probably never see it again. While I will most definitely see the OG film again. Did the bad guy um, tell uh, Jake Gyllenhaal that he used to fuck guys like you in prison? No, unfortunately, (laughs) he did not. Boo. Um, Yeah, and it's Conor McGregor is the bad guy. And, you know, I'll I'll admit he was kind of fun to watch. But, you know, as a person, I don't like him. Uh, But it's it's okay for a one-time watch. Okay. Well, thank you. And um, Eric, uh, what would you – what have you seen do you want to tell us about? Uh, nothing horror-wise, but seeing as me mentioned the Aliens 4K Blu-ray, I picked up the True Lies 4K Blu-ray. I want to pick up the Abyss one, but it isn't getting a release in the UK and Ireland because James Cameron will not allow them to cut the film. They need to cut the scene where the rat is submerged in the pink underwater breathing fluid. Uh, and James Cameron said no, so it's not getting a release. So I have to import it from the States. But the supply is really, really, really scarce over there for some reason. Like It's never in stock on Amazon. Uh, I, in Canada or in the States. Um, so I'm just going to have to bide my time and wait for that one. But I did watch uh, True Lies. Now, there's a huge controversy over this trio of 4K remastered releases that James Cameron has supervised. Uh, people are saying he's just overprocessed everything and all the film grain is gone. Everyone looks waxy and unrealistic. I don't really use, have a, I don't have a problem with that type of stuff at all. I mean, it does look very, very kind of slick and... and um, very very sharp but that's not a problem for me i'm sure that you know the, the film purists have an issue with it the film true lies itself uh, i remember seeing in the cinema i think it was great fun i haven't seen it in a very long time because i don't think it's actually had much of a release history in the d- digital era but um i thought it was great fun i mean jamie lee curtis is brilliant in it uh, oh god what no i was just th- talking about jamie lee curtis um the dance scene oh my god Oh yeah, <laughs> which is sorry. So funny. That's the 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 red blooded hetero in me. Just yes. Well, she out. does a she does a great job of going from sort of mousy housewife to this to um, undercover Ooh. spy, sexy underwear yes. lady. So um, sexy. Mm. Yeah, and the, the great helicopter stunts and everything, and so it's just lots of fun. It's like a it's it's Bond movie. It's like Bond movie with the comedy maybe dialed up slightly more, um, and certainly it's far superior to any of the recent Bond movies, in my opinion, which take themselves too seriously. So I'm a yeah, I'm a huge fan of True Lies. On the extras front, disappointing. There's really only kind of a, a really good forty five minute documentary about the making of the film, but there's nothing else on it. But hey ho, um, I'm still waiting for. I'm still waiting for the abyss to come in because that's my favorite James Cameron movie, and I'm dying to see it on, on Blu-ray because I think this is 
uh, well, certainly in North America, it's its first Blu-ray outing, as far as I know. Um, so I'm dying to see it. Okay. Well, thank you, Eric. Is that everything? That's everything. Okay. Uh, Nathan, how about you? The uh, only thing I watched recently is I watched that movie Lisa Frankenstein. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Diablo Cody, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, I wanted to like this movie so much more than I did. It it started out great. Like, I loved the beginning and uh, up until about the halfway mark. Um, and then I felt like after the halfway mark, it just kind of ran out of steam. And it just went in a direction that I didn't find as entertaining or or anything as I did the first half. So, I mean, I, I'm not saying I didn't like it. Mainly just that I didn't like the direction it ended up taking. Uh I was kind of hoping for maybe something a little more lighthearted along the lines of my boyfriend's back, which I love, by the way. Um, uh, but it's not, you know, quite like that. You know, it's its own movie, of course. Uh, but overall, I was just I was just kind of meh on it. I'm afraid. Have you guys seen it? Not yet. No, I really I really actually enjoyed it up until the very end, um, which felt like a reshoot or something kind of thrown in at the end. It didn't quite make sense with the rest of the movie. But uh, up until then, I thought it was actually a really fun uh, kind of modern take on, um, you know, it's set in 1989. It has good period, period detail and all that, but it's uh, maybe a, a, a more modern version of like my boyfriend's back, like you mentioned, which I am a huge fan of. And I think is a wonderful film and uh, heartwarming and, and funny. Uh, this one is funny too. And I really liked its lead character and kind of the places it was trying to go to and, and went to in some, in some, some spots. Uh, but that very end kind of, uh, if I could, if I could take that off that tacked on ending, I thought, I, I thought it was actually a pretty, pretty good movie movie yeah i mean it's all right it's not i mean I, I didn't hate it um i just i don't know i felt like i didn't find the lead to be a very likable character i did it first but then as the movie goes on i felt like she got more and more unlikable as the film went on until by the end i was like y'all can kill her that's okay i'm all right with that um but anyway no i mean it's um I, I, it's definitely worth a watch i'd say Excellent. Anything else, Nathan? Uh, no, that was it for me this time. Okay. I've just got a couple of, well, actually, I'll just, um, one thing. There's a few new films I'm reviewing for Hysteria Lives, which I haven't had a chance to post yet. One of them is a film that I don't think we've covered on the podcast, but it certainly is kind of due for uh, reappraisal, is um, Happy Hell Night from 1992, which is the bizarro um, dorm co-ed slasher uh sort of mixed up with um kind of satanism and black magic uh with the quipping killer priest um which is i hadn't seen it for a long while but i watched the the blu-ray 88 films put out some time ago um and uh it has the the really creepy looking priest with the black eyes who's been locked away in an asylum and two frat boys break um accidentally let him loose as part of a, a frat pledge and then he goes on the on a kind of well, goes on the loose and starts killing coeds with a a nice pick. Uh, so it's kind of a it. I was rewatching it again. It's kind of like a mega mix of eighties slasher cliches. Um, and it was a film that was made by um, or financed by Yugoslavian producers. It was almost they sat down and watched all the kind of like a twenty four hour marathon of Amer North American slasher movies, and decided to make one in nineteen ninety one or whenever it was produced. So it kind of felt a little bit out of time, um, but that was, you know, but it was still kind of, has, it's got its quirky charms. It also obviously was kind of uh, uh, kind of nodding to Nightmare on Street and Freddy Krueger with this, they took this very creepy looking priest played by, I think it's Charles Cragen, who um, it, uh, happened to be, I think he's in True Lies as well, but he he kind of looks really, really creepy, but he makes really, really bad puns a bit like kind of, if you imagine like just firing kind of Eric's joke of the weeks throughout a movie, it's kind of like that. <gasps> um, and so it kind of, it's kind of weird mixture. And then by the end of the movie, it kind of turns into kind of Euro horror, um, sort of, uh, kind of everything, but a kitchen sink kind of Euro horror, kind of Satanism, black magic kind of thing going on. So yeah, it's a weird, weird mixture, but it's quite interesting. It's got, a uh, an appearance or more of a cameo really by uh sam rockwell uh who went on to be quite a um quite a career 
later on and also Darren McGavin who looks incredibly embarrassed to be in it but uh, yeah so I take it you guys have all seen Happy Hell Night at some point a long time ago mm. it'll be a fun one for us to cover on the show at some point mm. so anyway that's uh, there's a couple of others but uh, I'll leave those for another day so um, Eric what do we have in the way of uh, kind of do we have a trailer for Brain Scan or a TV uh, spot? I got a TV spot for it yeah because okay. it's got a wide release in the U- in the US yeah, okay. Well, after this, uh, you'll bring us in and tell us all about uh, Brain Scan from 1994. Do not adjust your set. You're in the game, man. Brain Scan is in control. Play it, Michael. Brain Scan, the ultimate experience in interactive terror. Rated R at theaters April 22nd. When Michael, a lonely teenager, orders the latest interactive video game, the new high-tech wizardry penetrates his subconscious, Uwer misses, where his darkest impulses lead him through a deadly maze of murder, deception, and desire. Pursued by a homicide detective and prodded by the trickster, as they say here on the cover, uh, who looks like Susie... <coughs> And doesn't look like Toya. Oh, Eric! Th- this is what it says on the cover and the on the Blu-ray. Justin. Well, despite I don't think Susie ever had like bright orange hair. No, but this is what it says on the Blu-ray. I'm not making it up. Oh my goodness! Prodded by the trickster who materializes into his room, Michael is torn between the worlds of good and evil, of reality and fantasy, and ultimately life and death. And P.S. The trickster doesn't look like Toya. That's what it says. Is that what it says? Okay. That's what it says. Yeah. Just to preempt anything you might have to say later in the podcast. Okay. So this is a film. I don't think I saw Brain Scan when it came out. I think it could have been in the noughties, the 2000s, when I finally caught up with this film. Um, But this film couldn't be more 90s if it tried. And it's kind of, it's USP for me is the fact that it's so dated and it has that kind of time capsule element to it which makes it kind of fun um which works in its favor for me because i don't think it's a horror film itself it's it's okay for me that's about as 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 generous as i can be um the plot involves edward furlong's character of michael playing this cd-rom computer game that sort of makes you hallucinate or enter this virtual reality scenario so it kind of felt a bit like, and it predates uh, David Cronenberg's Ex- Existence, um, which to me is a much better film. But uh, this kind of does the same type of thing with it. And it followed in the wake of other kind of virtual reality infused films like uh, Lawnmower Man, for instance. Um, I thought Brain Scan was a better film than Lawnmower Man, as it had a, a firmer grasp of its own internal logic i thought the edward furlong character um he seems i think we're supposed to be he's supposed to be really sympathetic which i suppose he is to a degree but in the opening scene we see him ogling his neighbor who's taking her bra off and we're like you're a bit pervy really um and also i know edward furlong gets a lot of flack he's not the greatest actor in the world. He's not Sir Ian McKellen. I think he's fine. I thought he was good in Terminator 2. I remember him being quite good in the film Pecker that John Waters made in the late 90s. In this, he's okay. I mean, he's a bit one note, but he's not awful as I've read, you know, because I've read some criticism of him in this film saying that he's, you know, horrendously bad. I don't think he is. Um, But his character, I don't think, generates a huge amount of sympathy uh, considering he has, you know, his mother was killed in a car accident. Uh, He has this permanent limp from injuries uh, that he sustained in that accident. But um, anyway, any film that features you know, the latest high tech as it at the core of its plot is going to, is at risk of dating the film. And that's certainly the case here because you have CD-ROMs, you've got dial-up modems, you've got CRT monitors, you know, you've got 16-bit graphics. Uh, and then you've got Edward Furlong as well with his baggy clothes and his floppy fringe, which yes, Joseph, I did have that kind of haircut in 1992-ish. But as I said, I was trying to look like Brett Anderson from Suede, not Edward Furlong from Braid's Brain Scan. But I, I ended up looking like neither. I ended up looking like Sebastian from Little Britain when people look at pictures of me from that era. <laughs> and that's not... Why did you decide to call me out on this? I don't know what you're talking about. Because you were mentioning it yesterday on Messenger. I know. I'm yeah. just ribbing you here. Yeah. 
mm. for your pleasure. Yeah. I did love the bitchy character in this of called Stacy, I think is her name. And she's only in the movie quite you know briefly in, in a couple of scenes, but she dresses exactly like Dolores O'Riordan from The Cranberries. And, uh, she, you know, she, she looks like she's at a 90s fancy dress party or something. It just makes me chuckle every time she's on the screen. Um, Trickster is another issue I have with the film. I just don't find him to be that interesting. I find him kind of bland. I mean, I kind of like his look, which, as I said, is like Susie. I think they actually based it on Susie, didn't they, Justin? Um, oh, Eric, really? Just, I mean, I think anyone looking at Trickster will know exactly who they modelled it on. Uh, actually, I think he looks more like Tina Turner. No? Okay. Um, but he reminded me, do you know who he reminded me most of was Sideshow Bob um, from The Simpsons? Uh, because he never, like, he doesn't do any of the killing, which I think is meant to be the point of the character, but he doesn't have any kind of threat element to him. Um, and he's not sort of frightening. And I, you know, you can sort of see the, the machinery in the background of whoever's writing the script saying, okay, I'm going to create this supernatural villain. Who's going to become a big franchise star. And we're going to be the nightmare on Elm street of the 1990s, which didn't ultimately happen. It's kind of the same feeling I got when I watch shocker and, Oh my God, can you hear the rain outside my window? You started talking about Tina Turner, weren't you? Oh Yeah. That can't can't stand the rain against my window. Mm. Yeah, I was wondering what that noise. I could hear this noise in the background. It's absolutely torrential, and I've got to go out in it in an hour. Hooray! Um, so yeah, I was getting the same thing when I watched things like the horror show and Shocker that they were just trying to force a, a franchise onto us, and that's the way I feel with um, Brain Scan and Trickster. Um, I, I thought that the the opening murder in the film, which and you mentioned this, Joseph, earlier in the week when we were chatting that um, there's a POV sequence where Michael's character is going around like like as if you're playing a video game and you see him picking up a knife and going into this guy's bedroom and stabbing him and chopping off his foot. Um, and that's really, really well done. It's really quite an effective and um, there's a intensity to that scene that isn't really replicated in, in anything else in the rest of the film because everything seems to happen off screen then um, so for me it's I, I read a lot of the comments on IMDB about what people thought of the film and a lot of people said the same thing that I saw this in 1994 when I was 10 years old and it has a huge nostalgia value for me now whereas in 1994 I was 20 and Actually, I did, didn't even see Brain Scan back then. It was about ten years later, probably. So it has no nostalgia value for me. I just, I just found it a bit vanilla, I suppose. Um, so kind of a six out of ten movie for me. I think. I mean, I love the '90s look. I love how dated it, it is, and I think there's a couple of good sequences in there. Uh, Trickster, I don't think is the most effective horror villain in the world. But uh, that's my tuppence. Anyway, Meep, you're a big, bigger fan of this movie. I'm assuming you saw this when it came out in the 90s. I did. Actually, I'm holding the movie stub for Brain Scan. Um, at the, I saw it at the Lowe's Oriental Theater in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, I even have, I have a, I wrote down what I thought of the movies back then. I gave them, a, I gave them reviews or, or ratings at least. And I gave it three and a half stars back in uh, April of 1994. Out of five? Out of five, yeah, you would say. And I was a big fan of it. I thought it was very entertaining. Um, you know, looking back at these movies now, and I, I, I just do gravitate towards these 90s technology-driven movies. Yes, they're dated, of course, and the technology, we're way past the technology. And a lot of times in these movies, the technology was over by the time the movie came out. Like us using Skype. <laughs> like, <laughs> yes. Um, so this one has some themes in it, though, that seem to have, have held up over the years for me, at least. And that need to disconnect from reality, which we all are guilty of these days with social media and other outlets. Um, and it was right there back in the 90s. A lot of movies, other movies were doing it as well. Um, some in pretty silly ways. Uh, and this one definitely goes that route with the silliness that uh, can you can do with uh, the technology of the time. But I still think... Uh, it's underlying themes of a character who 
can't deal with his reality is, you know, he has a lot of loss, feeling of loss in his life. Uh, Michael, of course, uh, I had to gravitate towards a Michael movie for some reason, um, because, yeah, he's trying to fill it and he's filling it and his dad is trying to fill it for him. His abs- very absent father, who's not never in the movie, just a voice on an answering machine. Um, because uh, his mother died in a horrible car accident, and he, he was, of course, injured by it. And um, so he has all these things. He has all these possessions. He has everything he needs, but he has no, essentially no parents, no structure in his life. And so he often turns to video games, uh, Fangoria magazine, uh, VHS tapes of horror movies, and, um, and just... Uh, just that kind of need to fill his teenage life is what we did back then too. And we still do it now and to some degree. And I, I find a lot of those themes that it's trying to in, 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 you know, instill into this, into this film pretty relatable and, and kind of honest, uh, even, even if it's filled in a movie where they're trying to build also at the same time, a franchise film, like you mentioned with the fr- possible Freddy character, um, his fingernails are a bit much, um, <laughs> a little too on the nose with what they're trying to do with that character. But um, I, I still think uh, beyond all of that, I, I think the themes are there and uh, they work for me. Um, you know, I, 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 so in some ways, I like to look at it as a cross between a Freddy movie and an A24 movie, like a Talk to Me or something, which was a more recent film where you kind of play with the dark side. Um, because there was something about uh, going to those places that, you, you, you know, some of us, we gravitate towards it. And we, we, we try to stay away because we know that there are places that we don't want to end up um, and they might suck us in and take us away from our lives, take away our lives. And Michael, throughout this movie, uh, he gets he gets sucked in and um, he does, you know, he thinks he's playing a video game, but then he commits a murder which leads to having to cover up the murder, which leads to another murder. Um, and that kind of stuff is, you know, that kind of storytelling has been done many times throughout throughout film history. And you can even see it in the origins of like a gin or a genie story where uh, someone is really tricking you into um, into just just making mistakes and that's what michael does throughout this film he's a teenage character and that's another reason why i like this film it's a teen horror movie i do gravitate towards teen horror movies so you take the teen horror movie you take the technology part of it uh which i i have a lot of fun with um and and mix them together and it makes for me a for a fun movie some of the kills uh like the, the initial kill like you mentioned is pretty pretty gruesome the pov shots um definitely add to, to that uh atmosphere and tension um with that and how and how that builds in that first kill scene and the the, the subsequent kills don't really work as much because a lot of them are off screen um or just uh not quite and there's not quite enough of them which kind of gives it a bit of a tame feeling which is maybe a gripe that people have with the film it's kind of more of a pg-13 horror movie after that first kill and, and yeah, I concur with that. I definitely think there it could have been more uh, more to it with that. Uh, but uh, yeah, and there's also the element of the Frank Langella character, who's the cop who's uh, onto him or suspicious of him, and then eventually onto him. Uh, and then where it goes later in the film, I'm not quite a fan of that stuff, where um, where it's where it focuses it shifts uh, point of views to the Frank Langella and the and the mob of the town. Um, and some rando guy gets shot by accident. I'm like, ah, this movie doesn't really need that. It should just focus on Michael and maybe uh, just having a, that hint of uh, the p- the police being suspicious of him. Well, I just wanted to say real quick, considering what they did with the ending, that stuff never should have happened. I mean, he, he was not a witness to any of that. Yeah, it does kind of feel a little shoehorned in there to make maybe Michael seem a little more, I don't know, sympathetic or something. I'm not sure why they were going that with that. But, um, you know, those themes, like I mentioned, they, they do. this movie does share some themes uh, with another Edward Furlong movie of uh, Pet Cemetery 2, another movie where he's uh, Edward Furlong is grieving over his mom and then gets tempted by the dark side. 
Uh, though I think he's, you know, he's he's actually pretty good in that movie. I think uh, he did a, a, I think a pretty good job uh, of being. Um, you can see his change and switch over to the dark side of that one. I think he he did a good job of portraying that here. Not so much. I think he he does feel like a teenager just caught up in something. Um, who drinks a lot of milk, screams a lot when he wakes up from his video game. Um, but I like that stuff too at the same time, even if I you know have some grievances with uh, some of the performance. Um, but uh, you know, it was written by uh, Andrew Kevin Walker, who made uh, some other fun movies, and we'll get into that uh, stuff later of the the behind the scenes. But he did another movie called Hideaway um, from 1995, which is another kind of movie that goes into a little bit of a technology kind of thing, um, which I like as well. I think that was a, the man had been the same director as the lawnmower man. So there's something in the air in this mid nineties kind of uh, field that, that I, that I seem to enjoy a lot. Um, I also find that it's fun seeing a uh, horror teen horror movie set in the suburbs. And this one, in this case, it's supposed to be suburban New Jersey, which is where you're from, isn't it? It is. It's a, it's a made-up town called Montview, but I believe it's supposed to be a variation of Montclair, which is literally one town over from where I live now. Um, I think switching uh, to... Yeah, there would have been a good vibe having it shot in Montclair, which is, you know, very kind of like idyllic New Jersey suburbs, as, as, as you would imagine it would be. Um, but I think giving it this Canadian cold vibe this movie has, along with the... Uh, quite wonderful electronic score um, really elevates uh, some of the visuals and and look of the feel of the movie to me. I think uh, that's where the movie strength is uh, with the with the visuals and and the uh, score uh, by I think Howard S. Clinton, uh, George S. Clinton rather. Um, I really like the theme that plays pretty much throughout the movie. I think it really is kind of haunting and stays with you and um, and adds a great vibe to the film. So, yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan. I have more to say, uh, especially certain scenes, uh, but I want to pass it over to whoever's next. OK. Uh, yeah, I do like the score as well, I have to say, but, uh, apart from the uh, the sort of needle drops for the music, which isn't my cup of tea at all, but the, the actual score itself I thought was quite effective. And maybe before we pass it over to Justin, um, is New Jersey anywhere near Old Sweater? <laughs> oh dear, if, if my soundboard was working. <laughs> if only. Well, Justin, what did you think of um, um, Susie and her appearance in BrainScan? Well, first of all, I, I don't want to reiterate, beat, beat a dead horse, but I will talk about one. Um, so Toya is uh, it's clearly Toya. But anyway, our, our listeners have probably had enough of this rivalry for just for now. So I will go I'll talk about something else, which one thing I wanted to mention, um, just as an aside, do, do any of you remember the video game Atmosphere? No. Oh, was it a board game and a video game? Yes, it was exactly that. It was spelled Atmos, Atmos Fear, but as in F E A R. Um, and it was released, it was a board game, but it was an interactive board game where you had a, a before the DVD, you had a video cassette that you would, um, you would, it would tell you where to fast forward or rewind to. And you would have whatever the Crypt Keeper, whatever it was, telling you you're going to die or whatever. So it was kind of, it, re, it was released in 1991. So um, a few years before brain scan but it, it shows what the reality was really for interactive video games or kind of interactive board games were back then um brain scan this for me it was the first time watch i kind of guess i'm i'm a bit too old to have been a target audience for this when it came out i would have been in my mid-20s so um also i'm not even sure i, I did this get a video uh, uh of cinema release in uk i had a look around i couldn't see any evidence it did no because i know i mean we could talk about it in the background but i know it was a bit of a disaster and it got pulled from cinemas in the us after a couple of weeks from what i've seen so that may have um back then films tended not to get re- a uk release until about six months after the uh, north american release which may explain obviously why films that bombs at the american box office uh, didn't get released overseas but i i can i guess it probably did come out on video um I mean, I I kind of enjoyed it for to some degree. I mean, I'm not like you, Eric. I have no history with this movie, so I have no nostalgia factor for it. So it kind of didn't really stand. It felt very much like an amalgamation of many other movies, um, wrapped up in that kind of at the time that kind of fresh technological 
innovation i kind of guess of what where people thought maybe um video games would go in the future which arguably they well i i don't think you know it's almost it almost felt more like um they were riffing off something like videodrome the whole idea of you kind of watching something and becoming part of it and that kind of slightly i think you mentioned eric or maybe it was you and me that slightly cronenberg kind of feel to it but i don't think it really did anything particularly interesting uh with it necessarily having said that i mean it's a fun ride i I think Edward Furlong I, in Terminator 2, I, the character, his character in that worked better as this kind of slightly bratty but ultimately scared teenager. Um, in this, he kind of he doesn't come across particularly likable even in the beginning. He becomes as a bit kind of w- w- uh, shot worn for a fifteen year old, you know, a bit world weary, even for somebody that age. So it uh, he, it was difficult to warm to the character. Um, the trickster was I, I, very much something you would more likely you would seen in an eighties movie like Trick or Treats, where you know the or you know the the long shadow of Freddy Krueger was definitely hanging over this to some degree, and it reminded me of the 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 drill killer in Slumber Party Massacre two as well, kind of an amalgamation of all of those. Um, I mean, some of the t- takeaways I you know I, I t- took from it was. You know, one of the things, if you kind of took a shot every time someone said dude or man, um, it would be, you'd be under the table very quickly. And it kind of, it, it kind of laser focus itself to the time period with all that kind of grunge constantly playing in the background at the kind of party that was taking place, you know, during all these kind of hallucinations. Um, the, uh, I th- thought it was strange that I, you know, I would... I, you know, first of all, I was thinking, is this a slash movie? And then you had that first kind of point of view murder sequence. And I'm thinking, well, this is definitely falling into slash movie territory. Um, although I do wonder how easy it's to cut off someone's foot with a knife. I've never tried it, but I, I don't know if it's that easy. But it, it, anyway, the movie then veers away very much kind of away from the slash movie almost in entirety. And I, I think I read somewhere that they, they had planned to film some of the, mur- of the murder sequences and they decided not to i don't know if that's to get a lower rating or whatever um and some of the things are kind of aged in some ways it's like the 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 character you know ed furlong kind of spying on the teenage kimberly is something that arguably you wouldn't see in a movie today and it, it also had this kind of weird kind of disconnect the, all the other characters you know edward furlong was 15 when he made this and everyone else was in their 70s by the look of it um <laughs> that's I know his, harsh <laughs> well, all right his best friend was played i think it was 26 or 27 when he made this and i think the the actress is amy hargreaves who was 24 but in some scenes she looked old enough to his mother so it was kind of it was kind of this weird slightly kind of weird thing going on with it which uh, it was a bit odd um the other takeaway for me with this was that it kind of to be one of those movies that was written by somebody who perhaps thought the horror movies weren't good for teenagers you know there's there's a certain subsect of horror movies um where they uh, they kind of paint the picture that horror movies themselves corrupt and there's something going on in brain scan as well whereas the you've got edward furlong who literally has a noose hanging in his bedroom um or he has this massive kind of den bedroom kind of thing and all these horror movie posters never horror movie club but he gets pulled into the dark world of snuff and murder through his love of horror and it seems to be this kind of thing which is kind of run shot through a lot of 80s horror movies as well um this kind of weird slightly conservative streak politically um and i may be just over analyzing a bit too much but it seems to be running through this a bit as well that his love of horror has kind of essentially kick-started this kind of murder spree and he's impl- been implicated by it um so overall i thought it was okay it's not something i'd necessarily want to kind of watch again um but i you know i had a had a certain 90s charm i mean the the other thing that of course dates it and it's something we talked about before in early 90s horror movies um and sci-fi is the the cgi so the scene at the end um when he goes to he's directed to kill kimberly by the trickster um and then a trickster when he does and the trickster turns up and they start morphing into each other um it would have probably worked better with um sort of uh kind of practical special effects perhaps kind of along the kind of things you might have seen in the the, the carpenters the thing whereas they use this kind of proto cgi which to modern eyes looks very hokey a bit like the alien in alien 3 um well they did actually 
they did actually shoot a sequence that didn't make the final cut of uh, Edward Furlong and Trickster merged together. Kind of li- like an effect from John Carpenter's The Thing. Uh, but they scrapped it. I'm not sure why they did. Yeah, I did. I read about that and I was surprised because I thought it was actually, that was probably the most interesting part of the movie, that whole kind of, you know, if it had been done a bit better, more convincingly, I think it would have kind of, you know, you would have got some got some body horror jolts from it, but the CGI was so kind of hokey and of its time, it kind of, it just immediately threw me, you know, threw me out of the, the moment, I kind of guess. But yeah, overall, I mean, I'm glad I've seen it, um, but it's not, you know, I it's a bit of a meh for me, if I'm honest, so... You know, that's my tuppence. Okay, cool. Uh, Joseph, what are your thoughts? Um, there's a couple of things Brain Scan does really, really well. Uh, the best being that scene with Edward Furlong's character, of Michael, playing disc one of the title game, where, you know, like you said, he's essentially guided by the disembodied voice of Trickster to commit this brutal murder. And this sequence is pure slasher movie POV done really well. You have the kind of double punch of Olds, uh, the beginning, playing over the soundtrack as Michael makes his way into a stranger's house and he retrieves the weapon. He goes up the stairs and he finds the stranger sleeping in his bed and he kills him in brutal fashion. And then the song kind of crosses over into Olds, Two of Me, and it underscores all the violence in the scene. I, I really love this scene. I think it's so well done. It's really sort of techno-operatic. And sets the stage for, you know, what should be a fun thrill ride. Um, You know, elsewhere we have T-Rider Smith as Trickster. And I think he's a lot of fun to watch, honestly. And there's more on him later. And um, I had a... And I had a... And probably still have a huge crush on Amy Hargreaves. Which might sound creepy coming from a man who's pushing 50. But she was in her mid-20s at the time of filming. So I can say that, you know, with some dignity, I guess. But man, if ever a movie needed a swift kick in the pants, it's brain scan. I mean, that POV sequence promises so much that the rest can't possibly live up to, even if it tried, which I don't think it does. Um, Just about everyone, barring T. Ryder Smith, is either miscast or lethargic, especially Edward Furlong's character, who's Two modes of acting seems to be screaming until his voice cracks or looking withdrawn. You know, I thought the best friend character of Kyle was a much livelier presence, though I did sort of appreciate the friendship the two share. I mean, they're kind of both written as likable, and I like that there was this sort of, it's like this innocence between the two where, you know, rather than speaking the usual movie teenager lingo about sex or babes or both, they seem to be codependent to one another on the basis of maintaining this childlike friendship. I mean, you have the, the affirmations of buddies forever and then late night phone calls about video games and horror movies, you know, that sort of thing. And I really admired that. Um, as I was talking about T. Ryder Smith as Trickster, you know, I'm sure he's a character to um, divide opinions. But, you know, whatever you may think of him, he's the only one here who seems to be having any fun whatsoever. And I love his line where he says, no country western music, please. Every man has his limits. And I totally agree with him there. <laughs> He's like this kind of like... Not a fan of the new Beyonce album then, no? No, no. <laughs> not not a fan of any of her albums, if I'm honest. But um, that's neither here nor there. Um, to me, visually, he's like this three-way amalgam of like Rawhead Rex... Yahoo Sirius and Alice Yahoo Cooper. Yahoo Sirius is a name I have not heard in about 35 years. <laughs> he has that same hairstyle. Yeah. Um, I think the smart play here was not to make him make him a wisecracking kind of quipster to kind of match his ghoulish presence. Rather, he speaks in absolutes with this kind of upper crust inflection and cadence. And when he's asked to kind of go over the top, he does give it his all. But he does it without breaking character because we essentially find out he's more or less this repressed dark side of the michael character so he 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 hones in on that repression aspect very well and i think that was the point of the character overall uh for me personally i think he's the definite standout at least as far as you know energetic performance is concerned with this movie but you know ultimately even the good the film does and i admit it does some it just can't quite lift this one out of the kind of i don't know it's the pits maybe it's just so lethargic and almost morose. 
you know, like I said, everyone plays this kind of like they're in a morality tale on the dangers of technology rather than the campy horror film in which they're supposed to be. And so the tone is all over the place, I think. It's also a little too safe, like Justin said, for its own good. You know, it kind of limps to a conclusion that is very mundane, though I guess it is kind of inevitable, but it's very mundane still, I suppose. Though I did love the uh, final credits coda with the dog. I thought that was a nice touch of uh, schadenfreude, if not exactly a horrific ending that the movie could have used, but... I also think the soundtrack is pretty decent. I mean, you've got Pitch Shifter playing Triad. You've got that double dose of old when Michael makes his first kill. you got Primus' Welcome to This World, which I was so mad that uh, Michael cut that song off just as it was about to begin. Um, all bangers as far as I'm concerned. So, yeah, this one's a close call for me. There's enough here to give it a marginal passing grade. I just wish it was a little livelier and maybe not as cut and dried safe. And maybe recast the lead. So, ugh, decent, I guess. Yeah, I mean, Edward Furlong was, I suppose, hot property in terms of this type of movie back in, in this era. Um, you know, you're targeting a teenage audience. He's just come off Terminator 2 uh, and Pet Cemetery 2, which I thought was quite good. Um, Nathan, you're going to love Brain Scan. I can feel it in my bones. Oh, um, <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> uh, um, um, I don't know if anybody knows this or if you guys know this, but I'm not the biggest sci-fi fan. But uh, you do know that Brain Scan's not a science fiction film. It feels like it. It yeah, it feels sci-fi-ish to me. Now, on the other hand, Chopping Mall kind of felt sci-fi to me, and I loved it. So. So would would um, the brain scan have won you over? It had a few more exploding heads. Exploding heads and maybe people trapped in an enclosed location, like a big mansion, and the trickster was killing them off one by one. Oh, then I would be all about the movie. Um, for me, it's just one of those films where everything in the film to me is five out of ten. It's like the the movie to me is in general a five out of 10. Like it's not bad enough to be entertaining to me in the way that say, um, you know, splatter you or don't go in the woods, nail gun massacre. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's a technically well-made movie, but I wasn't very engaged in the, the, the storyline necessarily. Um, and so I don't know, like I said, it just kind of falls in this weird middle realm where, I mean, you know, and, and I'm sorry to fans of the film, but it's it's ultimately, I think, a forgettable film for me. Like, I feel like after a while, if somebody mentions it, I'll probably barely remember it um, just because it didn't really nothing in the movie really stuck out. Um, not even the trickster, to be honest. I mean, I liked him, but I don't know. Even he wasn't as crazy and outlandish as I was hoping for. Um, so, I mean, and again, it's not a bad movie or anything. I mean, I like to just say, like, it's kind of like if I were to review, say, a Western. It's it's not my kind of movie. So I'm like, I don't feel I'm being necessarily fair when I review because I'm kind of going into it with already a notion that I don't like these kind of films usually anyway. So, yeah, I mean, in general, Brain Scan, um, as I said, five out of ten. I didn't think it was necessarily bad. I just didn't think it was very good um i don't know i didn't mind edward furlong in the lead um i did like the way they ended it i like that what where he gives the copy of brain scan to the teacher yes because that teacher yeah. was really making me mad earlier in the movie comparing <laughs> horror movies to like rape oh yeah you are an insane person and i hope the trickster kills you now that didn't happen but you know i mean he is going to go through some grief which i thought was very rewarding at the end um, but yeah, in, in all honesty, I just, I don't know, maybe I just wish it was like a worse made film, like with really <laughs> cheesy acting and, um, like just really bad. And then it, I, I might've had more of a fun time with it where, you know, as it stands, um, you know, uh, I don't think five out of 10 is a bad rating. I mean, I think it's, you know, it's exactly in the middle, not necessarily good, not necessarily bad, just, it's there. 
So you're saying it's no crazy fat effle too? No, no, I'm afraid not. I mean, you guys know my taste in film, so... I want that CD-ROM! That's what Ethel would say. (laughs) Well, I mean, she would want the food. I mean, any food that is near the house, I think that's what... She'd eat that big chicken like Trickster did, which was gross. Are the hot dogs and bananas chopped up? Oh. And like you guys said, it's not really necessarily sci-fi. I don't know why I kind of lump it in there, but I don't know. I just kind of did. My apologies for not being a bigger fan. I'm sorry. No problem. Uh, Meep, you said you have more to say on the on the movie. Yeah, I wanted to defend um, something uh, you guys brought up about Michael, uh, as we tend to do. We sp- the spying of the next door neighbor. Um, <laughs> um, can I just say, yes, he does spy on his neighbor. Look, but it's re- teenagers do this kind of thing, okay? Yes, teenagers do this kind of thing. But then it's also revealed later in the film that she is actually also spying on him. <laughs> Yeah, but she's not spying on him in the nude. Well, <laughs> she's spying on him in private time while he's reading his Fango issues. <laughs> and that, which leads me to, like, the character itself. Like, he has a voice-operated computer, which dials phone numbers, all that great stuff, that uh, all that technology in the 90s that we didn't quite have uh, in real life, but we wanted to, aspire to. He had Fangoria magazines everywhere. He had VHS tapes. Uh, he brings VHS tapes to school. Uh, he shows his classmates horror movies. Uh, I might have been guilty of this as well as the as the person who brings the, the VHS tapes to school. Um, he has you know lots of phones, lots of CDs, CD-ROMs. He has a moped. Um, he has uh, a big house. Uh, he has absent parents. He has a cute girl next door who's actually into him. Why doesn't he? Uh... Why doesn't he crack a smile? I mean, if he has all that, I'd be. I'd be, you know, very cheery. I know. He's absent. He has an absent father and no mom. It's very cats in the cradle. I mean, I, you know, I, I didn't grow up with a, my mother passed away when I was younger, too. So I did. There was definitely that element, which, you know, I related to him as well. And I could see where some of the grief and why he why it led him to being kind of more of a morose character and why Edward Furlong played it that way instead of a cheery character. That makes sense to me. It doesn't quite always make for a good a uh, movie character going playing the most thing and i think a lot of horror movies of the last uh 10 20 years really have have done this made this mistake of making their characters morose uh so you can't really get into them as much it's not a good entry point for a character when they're always uh seem depressed and especially when they're living such a lav- uh, lavish lo- uh, lifestyle um but yeah i understand why you know they also played it that way as well mm. So, will we move on to some behind the scenes? Yes. Uh, Justin, since you're all about research. Oh, yes. Well, 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 tell us about your research. Okay, well, Brain Scan was a movie from 1994 starring Edward Furlong. Um, I do actually have, I have done some research. Uh, the The film, we didn't actually get, I mean, it got the kind of mix of good and bad reviews that you would expect from a horror movie back then um there's uh, just a splattering of uh, sort of uh, comments from a few reviews um the uh, baltimore sun said Ed- edward furlong is so transparent and listless he seems more like ectoplasm than the real live boy uh said t R- t rider smith made me sick it should have been called brain scam so but um uh the dallas morning news said to the extent that this movie plays with the idea um, fear that that the game unleashes the evil already dwelling in Michael. Brain scan uh, succeeds in conjuring a genuine edgy no, sorry edginess. So that got a good review. Kevin Thomas in the Los Angeles Times tended to stick up for horror movies, and he did for this one as well. He said it set up expertly and certainly does supply its own jolt. Although it's more ambitious and intelligent than most teen horror flicks, um, it could use a lighter touch. Uh, a couple of others, um, the Knight Ridder newspapers, wherever that is, uh, said the makings of a good idea. Unfortunately, they don't make much out of the interesting and topical issue they raise. And the last one is from the Rocky Mountain News. The story revolves around a trick that turns the movie into a major cop out. The last thing you want from genuine horror. Um, so uh, some of the uh, 
some of the um, other reviews I found uh, were kind of compared it to Night on Elm Street. Um, the Berkshire Eagle said is an imitation uh, as an imitation is remarkably dull, uninteresting, and derivative. But I did find a rave review in the Missoulian, uh by uh, critic Susanna Sonberg, who said this B movie is utterly gloriously driving. You may never actually be scared, but you don't want to leave your car unless until the intermission either. The game is too much fun. So it, yeah, definitely got a kind of mixed reviews. But then, like you say, most horror movies do. Uh, get mixed reviews so um yeah so eric i did do my research so i'd be interested to see what you have well i'm going to go hand over to meep next uh meep do you have any background for us let's see you know like i said it was set in new jersey uh it's supposed to be a variation of montclair and and you know other other months but uh but definitely filmed in canada i love you know canadian horror movies so that that really stuck out to me um director john flynn um he was an unusual choice for, for director of this movie um he directed some pretty muscular action movies like the outfit uh rolling thunder that same one that um quentin tarantino named his production company after defiance bestseller uh lock up the stallone movie and Out for Justice, the Steven Seagal Brooklyn action movie, which actually was on the set for for a little bit when they were filming. Um, so yeah, I I get to I got to see John Flynn direct somebody, but yeah, he was an unusual choice uh, for definitely a teen horror movie. But well, didn't he direct Good Night God Bless, which was a slasher film? I think he did. I think that might have been him. I didn't write that one down, but uh, yeah, for, considering his action pedigree, it was kind of an unusual choice. Um, and uh, you know the commentary on the Blu-ray is is actually the director's son, who shares a lot of personal stories about his dad. So if those who want to hear more about John Flynn as a director, and a person, um, you can listen to the commentary on the Screen Factory disc. Uh, it was written by Andrew Kevin Walker, who made a lot of uh, who made a big splash in the '90s with uh, with Seven, and he wrote the screenplays for other movies like Eight Millimeter, Sleepy Hollow, The Wolfman, uh, and more recently The Killer. But again, I wrote down, more importantly, Hideaway. <laughs> a movie that time has definitely forgotten, but I, I like it. I enjoy it a lot. Um, the director of photography, Francois Protrat, uh, shot a couple of movies that I really enjoy, including The Kiss uh, from 1988, the horror movie, the Canadian horror movie that needs uh, more love, and um, Weekend at Bernie's. Very random. Wow. Ooh. And then after this one, he went on to do Johnny a Mnemonic, which was a very uh, tech-driven movie. Um, also, the composer, George S. Clinton, who I get, I think, did a really good job with the score. He, he's actually on the Blu-ray as well, being interviewed, and uh, he seems very proud of his score. And I agree with him there. He did. Uh, he, he, had, he has a lot of credits. He has like over 100 credits. But uh, highlights for me include Boy, The Boys Next Door, uh, Avenging Force, uh, Heart, which is a great movie. A Hard Promises, uh, Mother's Boys, Hellbound, which uh, was a fun Chuck Norris movie. Uh, Austin Powers, he's responsible for the scores of that. And uh, Wild Things, which has a great score as well. Um, the makeup effects guy was Steve Johnson. He was responsible for a lot of that uh, stuff we probably didn't see in the movie that got deleted. Um, I, he has a funny story on the Blu-ray where he talks about how he and uh, the other makeup effects guy uh, basically got arrested for this movie because they uh, they were you know they they went they went up to Montreal and got and got caught up at, in customs uh, with all their makeup supplies and and uh, one of them uh, confessed saying that they were there for a movie the other one held true uh, to his convictions of, of saying that it was just just there for a, they were just there to have uh, just for fun or whatever. And uh, so they had contrary stories and they ended up in the in jail for a night uh, or the det- detention center for a night for brain scan, uh, which is kind of funny. Uh, so he had, he had a sense of humor about that, uh, that experience. And of course, uh, you know, Steve Johnson has been responsible for a lot of uh, great horror things. Um, you know, Edward Furlong, we know his career, Frank Langella, you know, I think he's a little bit, wasted in the movie i think he could have had a more dynamic character i'd like t Ryder smith a lot i think he's really fun in the movie um and one of the other things i wanted to point out oh yeah what was playing in theaters at the time because i like doing that um uh just so you know 1994 wasn't the greatest time for horror movies so there's not a lot of horror movies playing i wrote down serial mom which we love uh mm-hmm. leprechaun 2 uh 
Surviving the Game was a fun movie. Uh, Kronos was was playing at the time. And then uh, then a lot of other things that were playing were just like uh, movies like Bad Girls, Survive, uh, uh, Reality Bites, and Backbeat, uh, Hudsucker Proxy, and Bitter Moon. So not a lot of horror. And I think horror was kind of a little bit at a point where it was kind of it needed to be revived. And we know that's what happened a couple of years later. Uh, with Scream and all the post Scream. <laughs> I was about stuff. to say, at least it wasn't 1995. That was the pits as well, well as the 90s is concerned. <laughs> 1993 to 96, I was living right next door to a multiplex because I was in uh, university in Dublin. And of course, it would coincide with the barren year for the horror, barren years for the horror film. So I did see a lot of like uh, Hudsucker Proxy and Backbeat, which are good movies, but um, I probably would have been happier if it was wall to wall horror. Um, is that all me? Uh, yeah, take it away. Okay, so this was filmed in Montreal, as you said, in Canada for nine weeks. Now, the the computerized effects, the the you know the CGI and all that, were were created by a guy called Art Durinsky and Rene Dalder. That's the director of 1976's Massacre at Central High. So uh, yeah, so he was um, working in the effects department at this stage, but he was also going on to. Uh, make a film called Ecophoria uh, that was going to be the first film to use virtual sets which he thought because he was an environmentalist he thought this is a great way to cut down on waste um, so uh, I don't know if that film ever got made I think I had a quick look to see if it did and it didn't uh, did, nothing came up but uh, the rumoured budget for the film was 6 to 8 million and its box office gross was 4.3 million which probably explains why we didn't see it in uh, the UK and Ireland in cinemas um, because it opened in the US on April the 22nd 1994 so it is actually literally near its 40th anniversary but it debuted at number 10 in the in the box office Um, yeah the script the original script that Andrew Kevin Walker wrote in 1987 didn't have the trickster in it or or trickster I should say Um, that was something that was added in by sort of further rewrites. I find it strange that he, like, one year his film Brain Scan is in cinemas, the next year he's, you know, been laden down with uh, awards for his work on um, Seven. Uh, they seem like chalk and cheese, those films, really. But uh, there's a nice interview with him on that Blu-ray meet, but did you watch it, where he's, like, so appreciative of the sort of leg up the industry that he got with with brain scan and he said he says that like if if his if that was the beginning and an end of his career he would have been so proud just to have be able to say i had a film made into i had a script made into a film that made it into theaters so yeah he has loads of like really positive things to say he's not one of these artists who are like suddenly they're they have all these award-winning scripts and they don't want to talk about their humble beginnings whereas he's quite open about it which i thought was really refreshing and, and really nice to see um edward furlong appeared in an aerosmith video and you can see aerosmith posters in this movie for their uh it's for their album get a grip uh and he edward furlong is in a video for one of the singles taken from the album called living on the edge um, now here's a, a, poss- a possible blooper in the film is that the Fangoria magazine that the brain scan ad is supposed to be in has got total recall on the cover you know with the eyes popping out um, and that's from August of 1990 so they're either reading an old issue and seeing it um, advertised in there or else um, they've just got their timelines all screwed up and you know because that's not a 1994 yeah, the- film yeah, and that's the issue we just covered last month on Fangoria Flashback. Oh, yes, because I remember there was all that, oh, look, Susie's on the cover. Oh, look, Toya's on the cover. Blah, blah, blah. Um, as we usually do, don't we, Justin? Every single fucking time, yes. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Harsh. Um, 13 young, li- long years, L- long years, young years, long years, yes. Long years, yes. Um, and the other thing that I was mentioning that like um, Edward Furlong gets kind of flack for this movie. And, and part of that was was reading this quote from John Flynn, the director, who said that Eddie Furlong was a 15 year old kid who couldn't act. You had to slap him awake every morning. I don't want to get into knocking people, but I was not a big Eddie Furlong fan. Now that goes against what he said in the in the Fangoria article when they were covering this film in 1994 uh, where he says oh working with Eddie Furlong was a really pleasant experience now obviously he's going to be saying that 
in publicity materials for the film but at a later date he, he sort of said no it wasn't a good experience um eddie edward furlong had a lot of um family troubles going on behind the scenes while this film was being made um and i think i know i feel really sorry for him because you know he's just one of those child actors who sort of rose to fame a bit too quickly probably and uh it just, he got caught up in drugs and stuff yeah. as well badly he had to go to rehab like several times i think he's doing pretty well for himself now he's yeah certainly I, acting I follow again him on instagram and, and he's doing like he does, does a lot of conventions with um people like um oh who played the t-1000 in terminator 2 what's his robert name? patrick robert patrick yeah he does a lot of uh conventions with him and michael bean and people like that uh so yeah he seems to be doing okay oh yeah and he put up a post recently of he's five years sober so uh yeah hopefully things are on the 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 way up for him um because i do i remember him being really great fun in that john waters film uh pecker if anyone has has anyone seen pecker recently Peck is great yeah I love you pecker. have <laughs> Full of grace, full of grace. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, Nathan, do you have any background for us? Well, by astonishing coincidence, everything you guys have read, <gasps> I had already written no. down in the exact same order. Knock me down with wow. a feather. <laughs> I know. It's like we've been pulled in, into an interactive video game, isn't it? No, well, actually, I tell you what, guys, Dude. the trickster showed up and said that he would scan my brain if I tried to research. So, <laughs> okay, what do you want me to do? Joseph, I imagine you probably had the same experiences, Nathan. No, actually, I do have some background. Oh. Um, well, thanks well, for just making to correct me look my... bad. Mm-hmm. Well, just to correct myself, John Flynn did not direct Good Night, God Bless. I don't know where I got that from. It must have been Facebook thing. I don't know. But uh, some stuff from T. Ryder Smith's casting as Trickster. Um, he was given sides, audition sides for, from an early draft of the script, and he said that he thinks that Trickster in that version was just supposed to be a disembodied voice. And so he went into the audition not really knowing how to play this. And he made a faux pas when he first got there. He called, he he spoke to the receptionist at the uh, LA casting and he said, I'm here to audition for brain stem rather than brain scan. <laughs> and she kind of smiled politely and waved him on in. And he said he was kind of, deflated during the audition because the LA casting was a lot different than like, you know, anywhere else. They would basically would more or less watch the monitors more than they would him. Also, he, um, he provided the Igor voice, which is that telephone thing that Moscow is busy. Um, they were trying to find an actor to, uh, cast for that. And he was already doing makeup and he said, Hey, I'm here. I'm a voice actor. I'll do it. And so he did like three different versions of the Igor voice he did Boris Karloff, Bela Lugosi, and Peter Lorre, and they settled on the Boris Karloff voice, which they liked. And so he is also Igor in the movie, and not a lot of people knew that until he announced it on his website, I guess. But that's all I have. One thing I was going to mention um, that I forgot to mention was that uh, uh, there was an interview. It was actually the first mention of the movie was in November 1993. Um, and I think there was an interview with Edward Furlong and he's t- talking about the movie. He was very excited to be in it. Uh, but it also mentioned that he'd nearly topped the Japanese charts with his debut album. Um, but it says he said he threw away his copy. He said he was more into hardcore metal kind of guy. So I'm kind of presuming they somehow, well, he made an album probably of syrupy kind of um, love songs that uh, hit the charts. Look up the song. I think it's called When the Sun Goes Down. Oh, my God. Yeah. I see that. <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> cool. So uh, what was the consensus on the Facebook page or social media pages in general? Yeah. So uh, 31 comments for Brain Scan. Not bad. Sam Hart says, Edward Furlong's magnum opus, my current favorite movie to watch on Halloween. One of my absolute favorites. My other favorites include Houseboat Horror, so I don't know what that says about me. <laughs> and Dave Felter writes, Brain Dead. And that's it. Ooh. So I guess he just was not a fan of Brain Dead. Not a fan, no. Yeah. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram to stay up to date on all that we're doing. Listen on Amazon, Apple, iHeartRadio, Spotify, YouTube, and about a billion other podcatchers, both good and terrible. Join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per month to help support the show. Or if you're financially inclined, select a tier that fits your budget for that extra monthly bonus content. 
That's patreon.com forward slash the hysteria continues, all one word. And that goes for our email address as well, the hysteria continues at gmail.com. Justin. Okay, well, just to say, uh, we uh, just done a uh, commentary for what was it? The last slump? No, last last slump party. Um, boarding house. Boarding house. Boarding of course. house. Of course. Yes, we did do the last slump party a little while ago. So, um, which of course, if you have picked up the Blu-ray of the last slump party and you're missing our commentary, you can always play it along with it. Um, and boarding house was a lot of fun. We've had some good feedback on that one. And the next one we're covering um, this month, uh, well, for release later in the month, is Humongous. Uh, so that's kind of uh, tier, tier B, I kind of guess, slasher movie from Paul Lynch, director of Prom Night. Um, so, uh, yeah, that should be a fun one to do. So, yeah, join us over on Patreon. But, uh, yes, uh, talking of not so much fun things, I've got Eric's Joke of the Week coming up. It's my Joke of the Week. It's so, so fantastic. Why was the brain scan game rated X? Because it was a CD-ROM. CD. C- oh, my God. A C-E-D-Y. Oh, it was a CD-ROM. <laughs> no, it's, that's good. No, no, it's good. No, that's terrible, Eric. It's CD. Oh. Okay, will we move on to feedback? Because oh, yes. um, I've got to go to work. <laughs> okay, yes. Um, okay, so this is from David T. He says, hi, gents. Just a belated email to say congratulations on reaching both your 13th year and your 300th episode, both highly impressive milestones and a testament to how good THC still is, even after all these all this time. I've tried numerous other podcasts over the years and nothing comes close to THC for the perfect blend of humour, info production and that special ingredient that I think is the relationship between the hosts. Having a cheeky glance behind the bloodstained curtain, have you chaps ever thought about a T, uh, I keep saying THC, about a Hysteria Continues get together in the flesh? I know there are quite a few miles between you, but a live podcast of the Hysteria Continues meetup would be a fun listen. Lastly, a thank you for all the many hours of fun you've provided. After 13 years and being of similar age to you guys, it seems like we've all moved into middle age together. Here's hoping in the years to come, we can all become grumpy old men and creaky old queens. Mm, as a group too. From David T. Well, David, in terms of us all getting together in the flesh, it sounds fun, but none of us have any money. We are still waiting, hanging out, or holding out for that um, mysterious millionaire that's going to pay for us all yeah. to get together and then me, kill, it, kill me, us off one by one. Are you a mysterious one. millionaire? I wish. I wish I had Michael's uh, money in life with his house. I know. I want that bedroom. Like, I, It needs more daylight, that bedroom, for my personal tastes. But otherwise, yeah, it was pretty cool. Yes, I guess if you're a mopey teenage boy, it works, doesn't it? But uh, yeah, well, maybe one day, one day we'd like to meet up in the real, in the flesh. But uh, yes. Justin will have to invite us to his island. Ah, <sighs> that makes me sound like a Bond villain. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we've also got a voicemail mm. from Jay Yospa, okay, who is uh, a friend of the podcast. Here we go. Hey, hysteria continues. It's Jay, the Haunt Cub. Uh, been a long time since I've sent a voice message or any type of course uh, i still listen to every podcast and i do have to tell you that actually um you guys have steered me in the direction of many good movies because although i've seen my fair share of slashers they've been mostly the mainstream ones and i have not seen a lot of the more obscure ones and only a handful of jolly so um that's why i really don't comment terribly often on the shows because in a lot of cases i have not seen the movies yet Anyway, uh, I was recently at a Monster Mania this past weekend, and um, I got a poster signed by a couple of the folks from Halloween 3 Season of the Witch, Tom Atkins, Stacey Nelkin, and Dick Warlock. And um, it made me think that I hadn't messaged you guys in a long time, so I figured I'd drop a line. Anyway, uh, I got a really strange sort of backhanded compliment from Dick Warlock. He said that I reminded him of a younger, better-looking Sid Haig. Uh, not sure how to take that. <laughs> I guess it's the shaved head and the beard. I don't know. I wasn't wearing any clown makeup or anything like that. A um, couple little things I just wanted to tell you that were, I, I thought were kind of interesting. Um, first of all, I found out that uh, my dad's cousin, uh, whose name was Avery Schreiber, he was an American actor. And I, as a kid, mostly knew him as the Dorito guy from the commercials. But he played Sergeant Manny Ruggin on in Silent Scream, which I have actually not seen. But now I'm going to see if I can try to find. 
Um, also, I found out that a friend of mine who I met through my now partner, she actually was she actually posed for the artist who created the first Nightmare on Elm Street poster. She, she was actually the model for Heather Langenkamp for that movie, which I found kind of interesting. And now when I look at the poster, I can kind of see her face as a younger woman in it. So, um, but I was kind of blown away by that. Also, uh, a little while ago, you guys were talking about the Hell, Hell, Hell House LLC movie. Um, and I didn't know if you knew this or not, but there's actually a haunted attraction that takes place in that location. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, that's been there for quite a few years. And it's called the Waldorf Estate of Fear. <clears throat> it's a lot of fun. It's kind of fun to walk through that house after having seen all the movies. I still think the original was quite well done, especially for a super low budget. Uh, the the sequels and the prequel were not quite as good, but uh, I still love the original. And then the only thing I had was, um, I was curious, Justin, if you have ever seen the show Los Espookies. It's on HBO Max. Uh, it had two seasons, and um, it's really quite bizarre and funny. So I thought you might want to check that out if you get a chance. Also, uh, I went into an quote-unquote Irish store when I was uh, on a long weekend in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, <clears throat> and I happened to pick up some chunky Kit Kats. I had never had them before. They are definitely different from the U.S. version, and I have to say that they are superior in taste. Anyway, boys... Keep up the great work. Love the shows. Take care and talk to you soon. Bye. Well, thank you, Jay, for that. And enjoy those chunky Kit Kats. <laughs> they are delicious. <laughs> the whole t- the whole time he was talking, all I could think was Ricola, because he kept coughing and clearing his throat. I was going to offer him a cough drop. <laughs> I realized it was a voicemail. So. Well, that's the trouble with voicemails, isn't it? Once you start, you can't stop. But, um, <laughs> but uh, no, thank you, Jay. I haven't seen heard of that uh, series, so I will look that up on HBO Max. Um, or elsewhere. Uh, so, you know, thanks for the tip. And also, interesting trivia there for people having a relative that was in Silent Scream and also the original model for Heaven Langenkamp in uh, Night Run Elm Street. So, presumably, that was the, the one of the um, uh, the US poster. So, yeah, great trivia there. So, no, thanks for, thanks for phoning in. So, anyone else who wants to ring in, then obviously, we do love hearing things. We do, did, didn't we have one guy who used to phone in and tell us about his go, what he did in the gym? Yeah, that rings a bell. Yeah, a long time ago, yeah. Mm. Yes, yeah, so I know. Anyway, Eric, I know you have to rush off, and I'm being, I do. I'm, I'm, I'm being t- told I need to get out of my father's study. So, so the joys of visiting relatives. But um, thank you, Meep, for joining us as ever. Thank so you, Meep. Yes, yes. Is there anything you want to tell us about your up to at the moment? Yeah, because the Retro Movie Love podcast has come to a con- sad conclusion. Yeah, I wrapped it up after ten full years of doing Retro Movie Love, and I plan on getting a podcast going in this in a similar vein, but with a focus on more of a genre, um, hopefully later this year. So excellent. We'll look forward to that. And, uh, and what are we covering next time? Whose choice is it? It's mine. Oh yes. So brain scan sort of deals with an absent father. So our next feature deals with one who should have been absent and we're covering 1987's Thriller slasher, The Stepfather. And we'll be joined by guest Austin Stenberg, who chose it. Excellent. Okay, fantastic. Well, uh, nice nice segue into that. So, excellent. Well, thank you for listening. And, um, Eric, what are we playing out with? Which Edward Furlong song are we playing out with? (laughs) Well, if I'd known that... uh, Pitch shifter triad. Maybe I should play an Edward Furlong song. I was going to play... um, There you go. I was going to (laughs) play... When the sun goes down. (laughs) Yeah, I was planning to play... um, uh, turn off your brain and yell by suede but um i might change that to an edward furlong song if we can track one down i'm sure there must be one on it on youtube they're on youtube yeah. yep okay excellent. we're gonna play we're gonna play out with some edward furlong classic oh my track. god excellent okay right well, okay well thank you for listening to hysteria continues and we'll catch you next time so say goodbye to the good people bye goodbye ciao so long bye when the sun